Hey guys, Buildzoid here from Actually Hardcore Overclocking, and today we're going to be taking a look at the Maximus 12 formula from Asus ROG. Now, uh, this is a roughly $500 motherboard aimed at water cooling enthusiasts, which is why it has the completely unnecessary VRM water block. But, uh, you know, there is other actually kind of pretty interesting things that this board does that make it worth considering that aren't the VRM water block. Before that, this video is brought to you by Team Group's T-Force Extreme ARGB memory, which uses a frosted finish on its heatsink to diffuse the lighting across the surface. The Extreme ARGB kits are available in various XMP configurations, including 3200, 16, 18, 18, and 4000, 18, 22, 22. If you're looking for an ARGB memory kit for your next build, check out the link in the description below for the T-Force Extreme memory. Let's get all the unnecessary plastic and metal off the board and get into the interesting things, starting with the rear I.O., where we've got 10 gig of Quantia LAN, 2.5 gig Intel LAN, Wi-Fi 6 from Intel, ton of USB ports, PS2 port, clear CMOS button, and a BIOS flashback button. The BIOS flashback allows you to update the BIOS of the motherboard without even having a CPU installed, and can potentially be used for uh, recovering from corrupted BIOS flashes. So it basically gives, it makes it a bit harder to permanently brick the motherboard um, with a bad BIOS flash by, by having that button. So that's a pretty cool feature to have. Now on the board itself, we've got a... 8-pin and a 4-pin power connector, and with Z490, if you're really pushing a 10900K, you can actually pull uh, more power than the standard current 8-pin uh, power connector can handle. Now, Asus is using the high current connector, so this 8-pin can do at least 480 watts. It depends how hard you're overclocking the 10900K, but if your power supply has the option to populate both connectors, you really should because, yeah, 10900Ks can pull a stupid amount of power. Anyway, so moving on from that, um, we've got the postcode on the motherboard, which makes troubleshooting uh, very, like overclocks and actually all kinds of issues very, very uh, easy. Um, then we've got a power button, reset button. Oh, no, not reset, flex key. You can actually change the functionality of that button to be, for example, safe boot. Um, which is a very useful feature to have on a motherboard if you're doing a lot of memory overclocking because it allows you to boot the motherboard at safe settings without wiping all of your BIOS settings. So um, yeah, that's that's a really cool feature to have. Um, then hiding next to the 24 pin, we've got a bunch of color-coded troubleshooting LEDs that are very much made you know redundant by the postcode. But if you haven't learned how to read the postcode yet, th these are a quick way to tell what part of the boot procedure your your system is in and also what is potentially broken if if it doesn't post so that's nice to have and then on the bottom edge of the motherboard we've got a retry button this is basically a super reset button um because you can actually crash a cpu so hard that the reset button stops working well the retry button doesn't stop working it'll still work um, and the, th the other use for the retry button is that um, you can use this button to basically force the motherboard to try your memory settings again, because during the post process, the CPU with help from the motherboard is basically trying to figure out some uh, parameters for running the memory, which is called the memory training process. And sometimes it can make mistakes with this, especially if you're pushing very aggressive memory settings. Um, and so if the CPU is getting stuck on certain postcodes, mashing the retry button, and, and those postcodes basically tell you that you have a training problem, um, if mashing the retry button can actually get the system to post with better memory settings than uh, if you didn't have a retry button. Now, I wouldn't necessarily use this for, you know, daily memory overclocks, because if your memory overclock is very unreliable in terms of just training, it's probably not going to be very stable. And you might have issues where it's like, you know, you try to turn on your system one day and the memory overclock stops working because the CPU can't figure out how to retrain, like train it properly. And then I have to mash the retry button. And if your motherboard's in a case, then you're not really going to have easy access to that button. So it's not really a, like, it's cool for benchmarking. It's not really a feature I would be using in, in a daily system application. So yeah, but it's nice to have on the board. Now, for a $500 board, the only thing I, I'd say is really missing here in terms of overclocking features is dual BIOS, because uh, it's a $500 board. A second BIOS chip doesn't really cost anything. I have no idea why this doesn't have dual BIOS. So you can get motherboards that are as cheap as, like, $300 with dual BIOS. And, in fact, the $400 Maximus 12 Apex also has dual BIOS, so it really, like, 
th this is just something you like Asus does where they're very good about just shaving off every extra feature that they don't feel like you need on the motherboard, which like, I don't know, I would have appreciated, like th having dual BIOS would have been cool. It's not a deal breaker because you still have BIOS flashback. So it's not like you're completely screwed if you have a BIOS flash corrupt, but yeah, having dual BIOS would definitely be welcome on a motherboard this expensive. Um, oh, and the last thing that I forgot to mention in terms of overclocking features is this motherboard actually has a uh, op amp, which I think is that chip up there, which replicates the die sense voltage reading directly from the CPU die uh, to the super IO. So this is a unique feature to Asus Maximus, well, high-end Asus motherboards, um, not just the Maximus series, crosshair boards have it as well. But basically the idea behind, behind that functionality is that um, the Super I.O. normally just measures your voltage on the motherboard PCB itself. And the problem with this is there, uh, basically that voltage measurement does not account for the uh, impedance of the CPU socket, which basically means uh, it, it's off. Depending on how much current you're pushing, it can be off by, say, 100, 150 millivolts, a very significant amount of voltage it can be off by. And uh, now the voltage controller is not affected by this because that's not the Super IO. The Super IO is a separate chip. But um, the, the voltage controller, however, has access to the Dysense voltage readings, which uh, exist because the voltage controller needs a very accurate way of getting how, like measuring how much voltage is actually getting to the CPU. And the thing is with ASUS boards, because of how they work, you can't just ask the voltage controller what voltage is being fed to the CPU, just ASUS motherboard things. They like making things unnecessarily complicated. So the way they worked around that is they add this op amp, which basically replicates that die sense voltage reading to the super IO. So with ASUS motherboards, if you're looking at like your voltage readings in something like say CPU Z, which CPU Z always measures the, well, always reports the super IO reading, um, you're actually getting the die sense voltage reading with Asus boards instead of the motherboard sense. Well, well, it's not really motherboard sense, but like you're not getting the readings from the from the motherboard uh, PCB. You're getting them from the CPU silicon, which is far more accurate. Now, there's one problem with this. It also means if you're comparing voltage measurements from Asus boards to all other boards, they're not comparable because like, especially if you're using like CPU Z, like technically on say gigabyte boards, you can use hardware info to get the voltage reading directly from the controller. Um, but if you're using CPU Z on a say a gigabyte motherboard and you compare that voltage measurement to a high end ASUS board, or even if you compare like a low end ASUS board to a high end ASUS board, you're going to get different voltage readings because normally the super IO just measures on the, on the motherboard power plane and yeah, that, that voltage measurement is going to be, especially under high loads, it's going to be much higher than what the actual silicon is seeing. So um, this, is, this is a cool feature. Like, I, I do actually personally appreciate that the boards have it, but it's also kind of, it gets a lot of people very confused because they see high-end ASUS voltage readings and compare them to other motherboards, and it's like, oh, it looks like the motherboard is running 100 millivolts less voltage for the same overclock, but no, it isn't. Your voltage measurement is just taking place in a completely different place. Um, so, in my opinion, it would have been much better if, you know, we never had a super IO voltage reading that was this inaccurate, but the thing is... Uh, this idea of actually getting die sense voltage readings directly from the voltage controller um, is relatively recent. Like, technically speaking, voltage controllers have had die sense voltages since at least LGA775, if not even far before that. Um, there's really no reason why you couldn't do it on even older sockets. It's just, yeah, nobody's really been that worried about having super accurate voltage readings until relatively recently, so... But it's it's a cool feature, and uh, it's just something to to keep in mind when comparing like Asus boards to other boards. Anyway, let's finally talk about the VRM on this board. And so this is one of the other sort of weird decisions that uh, Asus made with this motherboard, um, which is that all of this right here is vCore. And that's really cool. That has some benefits, but there's also a major downside. There's no iGPU VRM. And the downside to that, of course, is, well, if there's no iGPU VRM, you can't power the iGPU. Therefore, you cannot use functions like, say, quick sync video encoding 
because that requires the iGPU to actually, well, function. So if you buy a 10900K and stick it into a Maximus 12 formula, it'll have the same range of functionality as a 10900KF because this board is physically incapable of powering the iGPU and the difference between a 10900K and a 10900KF is that the KF uh, still has the iGPU, it's still there on the silicon, you just can't turn it on because it's disabled by Intel. Well, this motherboard disables iGPUs by just not being able to power them. Um, not permanently, of course, it's just, yeah, board won't run iGPUs. So um, that's kind of a potentially a major downside to this motherboard, but there are some cool benefits to it. Um, like, for one thing, uh, Asus doesn't have to spend extra money on a second voltage controller because the V-Core here is an 8-phase and it is controlled by this chip right over here, and that is a ASP1405. And the problem with this is the 1405 is actually a rebrand of the IR35201, which does not support more than 8-phase output. And so if Asus also wanted to have their 8-phase V-Core and then an iGPU phase, they would need a second voltage controller to do the iGPU power. And that's expensive, so they decided not to do that. If you want to use the iGPU for anything, well, this board can't. So that that's, that's you know, benefits for Asus, cheaper board to manufacture because there's no iGPU power. Um, but actual useful benefits for overclockers from not having iGPU power is that you can actually lay out the power plane of the motherboard significantly differently. Because basically, in the CPU socket, you have iGPU power coming in sort of through this area. Um, so you'll have iGPU up there. And then vCore basically comes in uh, something like this. Um, so that's how vCore power gets into the... Um, into the CPU socket. Now, if you have a regular motherboard with iGPU power, that means you're gonna have a power plane, you know, that goes something like, say, this to some iGPU VRM up there and probably looks something like that. And then for vCore, you're gonna have a power plane that basically goes like this along all the phases. And so you have current coming in like that and like that. And of course, from there, so, you know, all your current basically has to go around the iGPU portion of the CPU socket. Well, with the Asus motherboard, you can just kind of go right over that and your vCore power plane can basically be just this. And this should, in theory, well, no, in practice, this reduces the impedance of the, of the power plane. Um, and in theory, that should lead to slightly better transient response because there's less resistance and less inductance between the capacitors on the motherboard and the CPU socket. So it should lead to slightly better voltage regulation, um, as in like millivolts, maybe, <laughs> like maybe one or two millivolts, um, or, or potentially more, but I, I really don't think it's that significant a difference. But uh, yeah, it's just kind of a cool benefit of not bothering with the iGPU power is like you can have a better power plane and that can help with CPU overclocking a slight amount. The downside, no iGPU. And that's basically it. So they've pretty much decided that this board, they're pri really prioritizing sort of CPU overclocking over, well, um, having an iGPU. And so that's, that's, that's what they've done with the board. And ultimately... I personally consider this board a pretty casual motherboard because, it, like, if you actually wanted an overclocking-focused motherboard from Asus, there's the Apex. And the Apex also does this with the VRM, where there's no iGPU power because bigger power plane is better power plane. With the formula, th this is a more, like, casual board in my opinion, so I really think people who were interested in the formula would have probably wanted the iGPU. Ultimately, I don't know, like, uh, at the same time, there's probably a lot of people that don't care about the iGPU at all and mostly just want the water block. So that's that's what's going on with the the sort of uh, power delivery here is just like there's no iGPU and in theory you get better vCore power delivery for that. Anyway, so let's talk about the actual VRM in more detail itself instead of just where it's dumping all the power. So for, as I mentioned, it's, it's an 8 phase, but it looks a hell of a lot like a 16 because Asus is, as usual, taking one PWM signal and shoving it into two power stages. So, uh, and the thing is, you have to have two inductors when doing this because if you didn't have two inductors, the power stages would fight each other. So essentially, each phase on this board looks something like this, um, where you've got two power stages turning on 
at the same time. And the reason why they do this is it basically gives you the same current handling capacity as if you had just a real 16 phase. Like there's a slight efficiency penalty for doing this. And it's so slight that it's literally irrelevant. Like it doesn't matter, but it, it exists. And the disadvantage to it is um, that you basically get slightly more input ripple. The other thing is with Intel platforms, you currently can't actually get a 16 phase voltage controller at all. Like the XDPE 132G5C from Infineon does not fu function on this platform. So th the only way you could actually get a 16 phase is to use doublers and doub doublers add a very small amount of delay to your PWM signals, which translates to ever slow, slightly worse transient response. Um, sort of in line with how much effect having is different power. Well, actually, the power plane has more more of an effect. And at least I think the power plane has more of an effect. It's really hard to test this because it's not like I can. I have like two identical motherboards, but one has a worse power plane than the other. But uh, it is a trend that I've noticed where it's like ITX boards have disproportionately good transient response because their VRMs are literally jammed right up against the socket, whereas ATX boards have the VRM sitting comfortably far away, and therefore the power plane is actually worse because it's longer. Because um, it's not about the actual surface area of the power plane, it's about how short and wide the power plane is relative to the socket. So basically, no doublers because they're prioritizing transient response uh, over, you know, having like perfect efficiency. It's it's really like, it's still a very efficient VRM as we'll get to. Um, and then the other downside is you get more input ripple and well, there's a easy, simple workaround for that. Put more input filtering capacitors on your motherboard and Asus does exactly that. They have eight, uh, you know, 12 volt input filtering capacitors, which is pretty high for a, well, for really any motherboard. <laughs> like you don't normally see this much input. Well, it depends on what motherboard designs you're looking at. Like there, there's been a lot of like changes to how certain manufacturers make their motherboards but if you look at say like older z390 gigabyte boards with really high phase counts they have like three input filtering capacitors so yeah asus has their their fixes for for the input filtering which is just have more capacitors then you don't have as much ripple let's finally talk about the actual power stages that you know um m make most of the difference when it comes to thermals here and for those, Asus is using TDA 21472s. And these are 70 amp smart power stages from Infineon. Now, there's a lot of Z490 motherboards using 90 amp smart power stages. But uh, the funny thing about 90 amp and 70 amp smart power stages is that within the part of the efficiency curve that you actually care about with a 10900K, they have basically the same performance. If you're comparing this motherboard to other boards with 90 amp smart power stages, it doesn't really count. There's no like m significant performance difference in between the two. I basically consider them equivalent. It doesn't matter. 70 amp smart power stage, 90, 80, same thing. Um, though funnily enough, there are some 70 amp smart power stages that are significantly worse than the TDA 2142s. So, it, like, the, basically, the issue is the nominal current capability of a, of a power stage just doesn't really tell you that much about how that component actually behaves in practice. It's just kind of like, well, theoretically, if you have one of them and a really big heatsink, you'll be able to shove the 70 amps through it. And then it's like, yeah, but nobody's actually going to do that because at 70 amps output, doesn't matter how power, like, if you're shoving 90 amps through one power stage, even if it was way more efficient than it actually is, it would still be producing a hell of a lot of heat. And it's not practical to make that kind of VRM design. So yeah, like do, the, the, the fact that these are 70 amps just doesn't like, it, it's functionally the same as if they were the 90 amps smart power stages we see from Intersil because the performance curves are basically the same. Now, these are also called smart power stages because unlike regular power stages or DR MOS components, they integrate a lot of functionality that would otherwise have to be added with external circuitry. So they integrate very accurate current monitoring, um, temperature monitoring, and a bunch of safety features like over temperature protection, over current protection. And I think there's like a bunch of other um, safety features, but that those aren't as important as like the OCP and the OTP, so I don't actually remember them. But yeah, so th these are called smart because they don't just have a driver and two MOSFETs, they also have a bunch of extra circuitry for things like current monitoring. Infineon does make 90 amp smart power stages, it's just like they're not really any better than the 70s anyway, so it's just... Uh, th these are top of the line power stages, even if they don't necessarily have the biggest, you know, nominal current rating. Um, 
anyway, so with these top top end 70 amp smart power stages, this board has roughly the following efficiency for uh, at, while running at 1.2 volt output voltage, 400 kilohertz switching frequency. Um, so that's just the operating parameters for the VRM. Now, 10900Ks can go up to around 300 amps current draw, depending on what exactly you're running, what kind of voltage, what kind of frequency, the workload. Um, but for this VRM, that's going to be no problem, as at 200 amps, it only produces about 16 watts of heat, and at 300 amps, it only produces about 24 watts of heat. If you're around 1 watt per component in terms of heat dissipation, which, you know, 200 amps, 16 watts, 16 power stages, literally 1 watt per power stage, and at 24 watts um, spread across the, the VRM here, you're, you're looking at like 1.2, 1.3 uh, watts per power stage. Like with heat outputs per component that low, the power stages themselves have enough surface area to keep themselves at acceptable operating temperatures. Not low operating temperatures, but you won't be seeing this VRM going over like 100 degrees even if you took off the heat sink and ran it naked. In fact, the the water, like the, the, the heat sink that this board comes with, with the integrated water block, is really doing more for cooling the 10 giga quantia LAN than it is for doing like cooling the VRM because the VRM will actually run really cool even if you're running like Prime 95 on a 10900k at the absolute limits of what you can you know push into these cpus it's it's really overkill because it's so overkill that you don't need a heatsink at this point but anyway if we keep going up higher to say like theoretic like the 400 amps you'd be looking at like ln2 overclocking and you know let's say you go exotic cooling solutions not just something based on uh ambient air temperature um like water cooling is so at 400 amps output, this VRM would produce about 32 watts of heat, and at that point, the the VRM heatsink actually starts serving a purpose. Um, the only issue is you're real like nobody's actually gonna run a 10900K at settings that regularly pull 400 amps for extended periods of time. Uh, 500 amps is like this is still theoretically doable on LN2, or not theoretically doable. Like this is doable on on LN2. Um, at that point, the VRM will produce about 45 watts of heat, but the thing is, like, this motherboard isn't even really meant for LN2 overclocking, and also, the, the funny thing about LN2 overclocking is, nobody runs Prime95 on LN2 for several hours straight, mostly because that would burn a hell of a lot of LN2, um, and that's the kind of workload you would need to, like, consistently hit that ridiculous amount of power consumption, so for short burst workloads, like, you could still run the VRM without any heat sinks, because it takes time for the VRM to overheat. Um, and 600 amps, which is, uh, it might be possible with some of the really, like, top, like, high voltage, high, high clock CPUs to, to hit this kind of current draw on LN2, I'm not sure, I don't have, like, super accurate numbers for what is the absolute limit of what a 10900k can pull but at 600 amps this vrm will produce about 64 watts of heat so basically the only time this vrm needs a heat sink is in real like unrealistic usage scenarios for this motherboard compared to the z390 formula this is actually a huge upgrade in the vrm department like the z390 formula's vrm is like i want to say a fourth of this but i think it might be more like a third I'm not sure right now. That was like eight power stages, 50 amps each. Yeah, no, that, that was like a third of this VRM. So eight, like compared to the previous formula, this is one hell of a VRM upgrade. And uh, yeah, like there, there's no scenario that you'd realistically run with this board where this VRM will have any issues. Uh, for the capacitors, we're looking at a bunch of Nichicon FP uh, 10K series caps for, well, Nichicon, the, the, they're the actual manufacturer. FP series, 10,000 hours rated, uh, 10K, which 10,000 hours, 105 degrees, um, through hole aluminum polymers. And what's kind of interesting with the capacitor configuration on this board, and on a lot of actually high-end Asus Z490 boards, is that um, for Z490, they've absolutely just stuffed the CPU socket with multi-layer ceramics, and uh, they've also added these two little uh, tantalum polymer capacitors into the CPU socket as well. So that's basically just done to further improve the transient response. So uh, yeah, like the, the Z490 power delivery on the high-end boards is like compared to Z390 is absolutely ridiculous. Um, so I'm a big fan of that. Anyway, for the minor rails, we've got VCCSA down here, which is using a pair of on semiconductor NCP uh, 3020, uh, yeah, 3020, uh, 3020, Oh man, I'm just 
Like, the thing is, th that's VCCSA, like, it just doesn't matter that much. It's not a very high current rail. It is the rail that, like, the, this is the rail that if you're pushing high memory clocks, you, you need to get the voltage, like, set the voltage right on it. But it's not a high power rail, so it's not really a concern. But VCCSA here is, I'm assuming it's a two-phase because they are using an entire extra ASP1405. And at that point, like, they've got phases for days, so I as well, may as well use them. Because they d technically have two, S two ASP1405 on the board. So, like, this one could have probably done iGPU power, but they would have had to get really creative with, like, laying out the VRM. Um, because VCCA power, VCCSA power comes in through the bottom part of the socket, whereas IGPU comes in through the top part, so it's kind of awkward as to where you would put your controller. I guess they could have, like, squeezed it into this area, and then had, like, IGPU over here, and then VCCSA over here. That would have kind of worked, but... Yeah, ultimately they decided, nah. Um, and so we've got VCCSA down here with a pair of 45 amp DR MOS components, which is the most substantial VCCSA rail on uh, any of like of any Z490 motherboard I've seen. It's also completely pointless because this rail really doesn't pull that much current. So it's kind of interesting that they decided to go this far for for just uh, system agent power delivery. Um, then we've got the various minor rails like VCCIO and the various PLLs in this area as well. But I'm not going to try to highlight those because well they're really minor and they're kind of just not like there's a lot of them so you don't have to worry about them they exist but they're present but they're not that important for memory power we're looking at a two phase um controlled by this chip right over here which that is a asp uh 1103 and for the actual mosfets we're looking at discrete mosfets and the thing is ddr4 is not very difficult to power um so yeah, this, this is like the stat, and the thing is Asus has been using the same memory VRM for almost all of their DDR4 motherboards. And the two-phase power can lead to slightly better voltage regulation, but in my testing, like, I've not noticed a difference in terms of, like, memory overclocking between single-phase and two-phase memory power, because DDR4 just isn't that difficult to power. Um, so the main thing that's important with DDR4 is what is going on with the memory trace layout between the CPU socket and the actual DIMM slots. And here we are looking at a daisy chain and that's about all I can tell you about this because Asus has this sticker over all of, well, I'm assuming it's a sticker. I don't think it's an actual like functional component, but I'm not 100% sure. But yeah, they just have this sticker going over everything um, which says Optim M3. And I'm assuming that like, the, all of the different board vendors will have different implementations of their daisy chains. In fact, even within a given a generation of motherboard, they'll have different daisy chain implementations. But this is an eight layer daisy chain of some some form. So the board has eight PCB layers and having more layers just allows you um, to do better memory layouts. That doesn't like having more layers does not inherently make a motherboard better at memory overclocking, but it does allow a motherboard to potentially be better at memory overclocking. Like you can't make a four layer board as good as an eight layer board. You can also make a terrible four layer, I mean, terrible eight layer motherboard. There's nothing really stopping you from doing that, right? But theoretically, um, w with more layers, you can get better memory overclocking support. And with daisy chains, the important thing is, is that these me two memory slots are favored because the way the topology works is basically the trace goes to the first memory slot and then just goes straight to the next. And so if you install your memory in the wrong memory slots, which the board even tells you which one are the correct ones, right? says right there um you basically end up with a signal integrity issue caused by all of this wire hanging off of the end of the memory trace um so that's the maximus 12 formula and I, like the, the thing like i i think this board is a bit strange in terms of its feature set like the 10 gig lan is nice the vrm is very nice i think there should have been igpu power um and there should have been dual bios but yeah if you want this board there's nothing nothing really wrong with it it's just kind of weird because it's like this weird cross between a maximus 12 apex and uh and a hero the, the board doesn't really give you as as uh, many features as i think it should have like say igpu power yeah it's just kind of a bit of a strange board but there's nothing like you know if you're okay with the fact that it has this sort of strange feature set then yeah it's it's a really cool board like you've got a really nice vrm 
very not like this is basically the best uh, daisy chain asus offers on z490 like if you go up to the maximus 12 extreme that's still an eight layer pcb with a daisy chain so this isn't going to have a uh ma like memory overclocking disadvantage even though the maximus 12 extreme has some really like cool memory power delivery but again ddr4 just doesn't care how you power it it's mostly about how you connect it to the cpu if you wanted basically the best motherboard from asus for running 4x8 or 2x16 memory configurations this is like this well actually i think the hero is also on an eight layer pcb but yeah this this is basically it um i guess if you want like if you wanted the apex vrm with four dim slots instead of two but i'd say you if you you should probably go for two dim slots if you care about memory, though. Like, sure, just raw memory speed. But, yeah. So, that's the Maximus 12 formula. Thank you for watching. Like, share, subscribe. Leave any comments, questions, suggestions down in the comment section below. And if you'd like to support what we do here at Gamers Nexus, then we've got a Patreon. There's a link to that down in the description below. And then there's also the Gamers Nexus uh, uh, store at store.gamersnexus.net. Yes, it's .net. Um where you can pick up various merch like shirts, uh, mouse mats, mod mats, all kinds of that stuff. And that helps out immensely with running the channel. So yeah, if you'd like to check those out, they're in the description. That's it for the video. Thank you for watching and goodbye.